Today is going to be a little bit of a challenge. We don't exactly have a high budget and the competition is fierce. So join me on a little bit of an adventure. But firstly, let's meet the competition. What's going on everybody? My name is Aaron, but you may also know me as Hobbs Tech. I run a YouTube channel based off of budget PC hardware with a little over 800 subs. I've been dabbling into a more personalized style lately, and if you guys want to see my build for this challenge, don't forget to stop on by. And if you like what you see, why not drop a sub as well? With all that said, thank you and good luck to the other participants. Hello everybody, my name is Teko and I do tech related and budget videos on my channel. Now, I wish everybody the best of luck in this competition and I would also like to thank Budget and Hobbs for inviting me to this competition. So yeah, again, I would like to thank everybody and I wish everybody the best of luck. Hi guys, my name is Owen, otherwise known as Techwen, and what I do on YouTube is review PCs and build them and review other pieces of technology. I give good luck to everyone taking part in this challenge, and I will see you on the other side. I'm sure a link will be in the description if you want to check out my videos. Goodbye. So when given £5, aside from waiting for the boot fair, our main choice to actually get anything is to fire up Gumtree. And well, Gumtree isn't exactly renowned for having the best deals around or the wisest sellers. So it was around this point I managed to stumble across a gaming PC for a low, low £1, complete with bundles of cables and tons of other stuff we don't really need. So I called them up on the phone, secured the deal, and went off to collect the PC. Luckily, I'd been able to arrange collection on the same day as the local boot fair, and I was able to secure a few bags of junk, which included a lot of videos, cassettes, including the 1989 hit special of Nicholas and Raymonda's wedding, which I'm sure we'll all agree was a classic time to remember. But moving on to the topic once again, why don't we take a look at the gaming PC we just picked up for £1. And there we have it, the whole £1 gaming PC, which is absolutely covered in dust, however it does come with a Pentium 4 Northwood at 2.5GHz, which is worth less than its weight in scrap value, 512MB of DDR400MHz RAM, and an old 120GB IDE hard drive. Not exactly peak performance, but it's not really those parts we're focusing on. We can repurpose the hard drive, and we can use that somewhat okay 200 watt power supply as I have an idea for things and what we can actually get away with given our current budget. And things are beginning to take shape part-wise given the £2 bag we picked up from the boot fair. Despite our current parts fulfilling their role, the case is proprietary in some areas and the power supply is incredibly low wattage. But these issues we can deal with later on. Firstly, we need to get this Dell gaming PC ready for a real clean out. With that out of the way though, it's time to make some modifications as we're being ranked on aesthetics, which currently we have none of, noise levels and temperatures, which aren't going to be great, and power consumption, once again an area that I don't think is going to be very well, for us at least. Of course, gaming performance in numerous amounts of titles we might have some success in, but we've already spent £1 on the PC, picked up those two bags of junk for £2, but we need a graphics card from somewhere in the £1 region. So what exactly does that leave us? Well, we can use our £1 HD4890, leaving us with £1 for modifications. So I headed off to my local Poundland, went to the back of the store and found the reduced section, where I managed to grab a healthy selection of stuff for our £1 modifications, including white radiator enamel, as I can't afford paint, some vinyl wrap for 25p, as not many people seem to be interested in the swamp water aesthetic it's providing, and spent 50p on some cable ties and some paint brushes to actually allow us to put this thing together. So there's our full £5 budget all sorted out. So outside modification-wise, there isn't exactly much we can get away with, mainly because I have the artistic talent of a toddler and no skills at creating things whatsoever. In fact, my PC just sits under the desk regardless of what it looks like. And, I mean, these clash quite badly with the colour scheme, so it doesn't really matter about that. I decided to keep things minimalistic and simple by attempting to give the inside of our case a white undercoat, giving us that sort of reflective design sought after by gamers of today that like their cases looking like the insides of a radiator.
And after yet another time lapse, the paint had completely dried, and by that time the sun had actually set. Oddly enough, radiator enamel does take quite a while to drive, which isn't exactly surprising on many levels. You do have to factor in the time and dedication that not only went into painting the case, but also the creation of a custom power supply shroud in swamp green marble aesthetic. But it did give us that nice premium look that's a bit more creative and trustworthy than unbranded grey power supply units with 500 watts written on the top and 4 Martha written on the bottom. But part wise we're not going to be able to use the PC, we're going to have to add our own parts. So what did I actually manage to grab from the boot fair? Well we have an ECS motherboard which isn't in the best of states, 2GB of DDR2 RAM, as the board originally came with 4GB installed which explains why it didn't work and probably why it ended up at the boot fair, because the board doesn't actually allow over 2 gigs of RAM to be installed. We also got the luxury of using a Pentium D945 with burn marks on the bottom, one of Intel's best designed chips in existence, which needs to be cooled by the broken stock cooler for a Core 2 Duo a chip that uses half the power of the Pentium D, so things are going to get toasty. But if that wasn't warm enough for you, we have the HD4890, which we grabbed from £1 from CEX a few days ago, all together being powered by two power supplies in tandem. Could this machine get any worse? And there we have it, topped off with some Christmas lights from the random bag of junk from the boot fair, and it looks perfect, it has that RGB everyone's on about, one of those Intel CPUs you always see on TV, and a Radeon inside, which the Nintendo Wii had, so that's really really good at gaming. And that fit wasn't actually worth the sarcasm, that is actually a capable GPU. Now onwards we go for some more fun. The motherboard doesn't actually like any new operating systems, in fact it struggles running Windows XP Service Pack 3. It prefers to use Windows 98 and those later 90s operating systems, at least on the beta BIOS which is the only one that supports the Pentium D series. We also have to use a screwdriver to turn the PC on, which isn't great either, and we're greeted by coil whine and noises from the hard drive, so we know that things are being powered exactly as safe as you'd imagined. Eventually, after straight up copying a fully installed Windows 7 image to the PC, expanding it on the system and then later allowing it to repair itself, the PC was booted, and we have a full system capable of running Windows 7. But with an OS on the system, why don't we jump straight into some real gaming benchmarks. Firstly, we have started off with Half-Life 2, which we maxed out with HDR enabled, and 16x anisotropic filtering also enabled, all in the 1080p resolution so we didn't need any MSAA. The Pentium D945 was maxed out throughout our entire time playing, but overall we saw a pretty fluent 126 FPS on average, with frame times that were relatively stable up until data needed to be loaded in, which caused us to go down to our 0.1% lows of 36 FPS, but even so the HD4890 was underutilized and the hard drive was the thing causing these frame drops in the first place due to it being too slow to load in the data we needed. RimWorld, which is still one of my favourite games out right now, still runs perfectly fine with 46 FPS on average, with frame times only poor because of the CPU performance when accelerating the game, as when you're not running too fast the game did run absolutely fine, as shown by that 46 FPS on average. Although not a bad experience, it could cause some issues in the late game, but the game is still highly single thread dependent, which is where the Pentium D isn't so hot. Although maybe with time and the inclusion of the 64-bit mode in the latest update, this could be improved, a £5 PC is definitely going to struggle when this game gets tough. 
CS Source was running even better than Half-Life 2, even with the same caliber of settings enabled. We saw a highly competitive 137 FPS on average, with decent frame times on par with this. Once again, the loading was quite bad due to our overloaded CPU and poor hard drive, which began to make grinding noises even when entering a new stage. Crisis was running in 720p with the high settings enabled, and it was running somewhat okay with decent average frame rates and somewhat okay frame times. But here was a game that provided major issues in terms of those frame times. See, trying to shift some load to the GPU with the high settings was virtually impossible as we lacked the RAM to run it with these settings. But when the game was running in lower settings, it was a bit better. But the CPU was stuttering due to how imbalanced it was with the CPU and GPU, paired with that low amount of RAM and the poor hard drive speed, which really didn't help overall. Altogether, Crisis will work and it is a smooth experience sometimes, but for a vast majority of the time the CPU and GPU are just so imbalanced that it doesn't work well. Fortnite told me my graphics card was a virus and refused to work. Next of all, with our benchmarks, Hops Tech actually bought me the game to benchmark, as it's one of his favourites called Bloody Boobs. It ran at 70 FPS on average, which unfortunately due to how this platform works, I can't even show. Even if the gameplay doesn't actually make sense, the game was ran with the highest two options enabled, which is beautiful and 1080p, and even then it wasn't great. The second of the two choices was Roblox, which I have no idea how to play or test, but I'm pretty sure that jumping on this conveyor belt with a silky smooth 59 FPS is as great as this game gets, including the fact it was with the highest options in the 1080p resolution. Not to mention that I got stuck in a small cubicle which seemed to be the peak of entertainment in this game. Fable The Lost Chapters with the highest settings in 1080p ran very close to 60fps for the majority of the time, which was a nice change from the last few games. Of course this £5 hunk of junk really shines through with these older titles, as the Pentium D is fully utilised and the HD4890 is free to run them maxed out as much as it can. Of course the overlay didn't show in this game which is a bit funny with Fable as the way it operates, as the original titles don't operate as part of the game, they operate separately, so it can be a bit confusing for MSI Afterburn. Either way, frame times were okay, and you can see from the smoothness of the gameplay that it was a great experience on the machine. Minecraft in 1080p was playable, but the game would stutter heavily when loading, which could often be a disturbance when you wanted to explore further. It was likely due to our CPU running at full utilisation, and the latest versions proving to be more taxing than some of the earlier versions that were last tested on the Pentium D. Of course, dropping that resolution down to 720p does mean that the Pentium D is processing less pixels, which sort of helps here. It freed up just enough headroom to make travelling exploration a tiny bit smoother, which is overall reflected in our frame times, which still suffered a lot in the event of loading a few chunks, but overall it's not a bad experience at all on a machine like this. Discord, which is something most of us use nowadays, although not a major test for a system like this, was something I considered worth testing as I was frequently using it and I wanted to prove that it does run somewhat nice on a machine like this, so I thought I may as well show you guys that you can use Discord and Discord-like applications. Newer indie titles like Software Inc, while using medium settings in the 900p resolution, worked absolutely fine, although as reflected by the frame times when it came to speeding up the game, the CPU would struggle. Which, although not a major issue in the early game like this, when running a larger company in the late game, it could prove to be much more taxing on the CPU, and not exactly the kind of performance you're looking for in a game like this, where you'll be speeding up the game quite a lot. As for the latest GTA game we could run, we could actually run GTA 5, although we had to run it in 240p with no shadows, and even then the performance was abysmally poor. In fact, it was so hard to see it on screen using the type of camera equipment I have that I had to use an external capture device to try and show you guys what it looked like. It hovered around the 20fps region, which isn't exactly ideal at all, and the RAM was definitely a major limit, not mentioning the fact the CPU was locked at 100% throughout our entire time playing, and I wasn't using modded HD4890 drivers, so these drivers actually hate running the game as well, but it did start. 
3 Mark's Ice Storm reflected exactly what the game showed us. A combination of a weak CPU and poor RAM resulted in a very one-sided system with too much graphical power. Although in most older titled games this was absolutely fine, in fact even newer indie games ran nice. It was mainly just games where they were too heavy in solely one area and those resulted in a lot of issues. They were mainly CPU dependent ones, but I'd argue that Crisis was an exception as it hated absolutely every component of this system being so equally unbalanced. The same goes for things like Cinebench which scored us 71 points which is just about average for a Pentium D running at stock speeds when paired with some standard spec DDR2 RAM. Finally, one issue I did want to mention was that some titles like Skyrim would just refuse to work, likely because our motherboard doesn't even like the operating system it's running. I've tried things like new drivers, everything like that, but some titles just won't even start despite actually being more than enough to run on a system like this. So in conclusion, my £5 PC. Well, for general usage it was absolutely fine. Everything from web browsing to Discord, even YouTube was possible, as long as you set your expectations moderately low for what £5 should actually get you. However, the PC is loud. Without any way of actually monitoring the sound levels, I can just show you what it sounds like. But let's just say under load, as you can hear... It is extremely loud. But when things were relatively calm, the hard disk drive was actually the loudest part. Which usually people say is a quiet thing, but in our case, no, the hard drive was actually exceptionally loud, which I'll let you hear now. As for the other categories, we needed to see if the machine could record and edit, which we managed to do using OBS, as you can check out the video that I produced on this system down in the description below, which is just a quick 5 minute let's play that was recorded and edited using the Pentium D system. Power consumption wise we were pulling around 337 watts under load. That would be accurate, however given the power supply's efficiency and the fact there's two of them, this equated to around 418 watts power draw at the wall. So not exactly power efficient on any levels considering we're losing about 100 watts in pure efficiency loss. But it does have the advantage of actually allowing us to overclock the system, which may have contributed here or there, due to the fact I increased the card by 50 MHz. I didn't really touch the CPU as I didn't really want to blow up anything else, as the power supplies were already making a lot of loud noises just turning on. Although this is one of the most strange looking impractical gaming machines out there right now, I will link everyone else's video down in the description below which I do recommend giving a watch to as they are very good videos. We'll be doing a follow up livestream to announce the winners and see how everyone's performance compares to each other. Thank you very much for watching, Good night. So it's been a fun collab video and I appreciate the effort everyone's put in so why not check out their videos in the description below. I'll catch you guys in the next video and don't forget if you actually want to see where we picked up these parts you can always go to the Patreon, donate a dollar and actually watch those videos.